Auxiliary grounding electrodes. Now, this used to be called a supplemental. Let me just show you a picture here. This is where somebody drives a ground rod that's not necessary by the code. So, John, a ground rod at a pole. Mario, maybe we can even get that picture of the pole and bring it inside here. That ground rod we had that Mario had taken the picture of the ground rod at a pole, that's an auxiliary electrode. It's not required by the code. And when it's not required by the code, then there are no requirements because it's not required by the code. But we have a requirements telling you it's not required to comply by the code. Do you know why we have requirements telling you you don't have to comply by the code? You, you don't need it. it but why do we have requirements telling you you don't have to comply by the code? We have a requirement, 21554 says you don't have to comply by the code. Right. Do you know why? Anybody know why? What's that? Let's see with anybody else. Because they had so many people submitting public inputs about it, they had to make sure everybody knew exactly that oh. you did not have to have. This wasn't a requirement. It was optional. <clears throat> I was going to say to make the ground rod guys happy. No, no, no. No, they have requirements telling you you don't have to comply by the code. That's what 25054 says. The ground rod guys wanted it to be required. To, to have right? requirements. They wanted okay. it to be required okay. by the code. So they didn't make the ground rod guys happy. Okay, no, they didn't. It. The reason they have it, as, as Brian was saying, is that people kept submitting public inputs to give the requirements to ground rods that are not required. Right. And inspectors were actually trying to enforce requirements on ground rods that are not required. So by putting in a rule saying there are no requirements, then the inspectors can't require you to do something that's not required because it says it's not required. And then it solves the problem of every single code cycle submitting panel five, hey, here, you should be requiring this. Like, no, we already say it's not required. So we're done. So, so we have a requirement telling you you don't have to comply with the code for those people that think you're supposed to comply with the code. Brian? We have a similar um, type of a rule with burial depth on the bonding jumper. For and, and we're going to get into that one. <laughs> exactly. All right. So this is called an auxiliary electrode. It used to be called a, sup a supplementary electrode. It was called a supplementary electrode at one time. And they said, well, you know, a supplementary electrode and the water pipe supplemental electrode was, you know, it's just a little too close. So they wanted to call it, gosh, there was a word, they, there was a public input, was it called it? You're, I remember you saying in the video, was it superfluous? Or yeah, like su that? A superfluous electrode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they couldn't, you know, they, they agreed on an auxiliary, something extra, an auxiliary electrode. So here's what the code says. An auxiliary electrode, which the electrode isn't required, isn't required to be bonded to the building grounding electrode system. You see, all electrodes 25050 have to be bonded together. Is that right? Well, not auxiliary electrodes. And it's not have to be sized in 25066, because 25066 tells you how to size the grounding electrode conductor. But this is an auxiliary electrode. This is not a grounding electrode conductor. We don't know what it's called. So there's no table. And it doesn't have to have a contact resistance of 25 ohms for a single electrode. Because some inspectors are saying, well, you know, you got to run a wire to that. You got to make sure you put two ground rods there. You got to get the 25 ohms. Like, no, no, this is something I don't need to do. So these are the rules telling you, no, you don't have to do any of those things. You could run some Cat 5 wire and, and you know, put in a <laughs> PVC 16 penny nail on PVC pipe. Yeah, PVC pipe. You can do anything you want to do because it's not required. But industries sometimes think it's a good idea. Uh, here's an example, Miami. I saw these guys driving ground rods next to this light pole. Uh, we were in um, Lejeune or wherever. Fort, Fort Bragg. Fort Bragg, where here's a motor, you know, to a ground rod. Motor is welded to a steel base that's welded to a steel frame that's <laughs> welded to the rebar in the slab, and they still ran. And an equipment grounding conductor. And an equipment grounding conductor. Is that a water treatment plant? No. No? Military base. Military base, okay. Okay, so these are auxiliary electrodes. It's fine. The code is not prohibited. And Eric, we're not going to get into the details. Please, thank you, sir. Okay. <laughs> so now, auxiliary grounding electrodes serve no purpose related to the National Electrical Code. And the National Electrical Code is what? Make sure it's safe, right? Mara, you said earlier, practical safeguard and persons and properties by the use of electricity. You know, but I mean, so if it fails, Eric, like you said, we want to make sure it fails relatively safely or attempting to remove it. But an auxiliary electrode is not clearing a fault. Driving a ground rod to something, it serves no purpose at all. Now, here's one. Somebody sent me this. This was, I think, in, I think this was at the... 
Statue of Liberty in New York, where guys sent me a picture that they drove a ground rod and they kind of connected it to these lights. I bet you need an equipment grounding conductor, right? But not an auxiliary electrode. What are the hazards? Well, EPRI, Electric Power Research Institute, did a big study on auxiliary electrodes. And look at the text research. It says here, different manufacturers state different benefits from the supplemental electrode. So this report was written, research, right? You, can, you know the code for a while. This was written when what? It wasn't called an auxiliary electrode. It was called a supplemental. It actually was a supplementary electrode at that given time. It says, listen, different manufacturers state different benefits from the supplemental electrode. However, field experience at sites with the supplemental ground rods have shown that the rods may actually increase the risk of CNC electronics damages. So you're thinking you're driving a ground rod and you're thinking you're doing a good thing, at least they do. And then it went on. And so here they want this electrode. But if you have a lightning strike, then you have a ch charge voltage gradient. It can go up and over and down and then go out the other end. I think we mentioned it a little bit yep. on that one video that if lightning strikes the earth, it kind of goes up and down. Last thing you want to do is a high frequency, high current going through your electronic equipment and then creating this explosive electromagnetic pulse, right? An EMP right next to your electronic equipment. That's not what you want to do. But they don't know that. They're thinking, well, we want to make sure that we have a connection to the earth. And who knows where that started? I'm sure it started in the 70s. It started with noise. <clears throat> yeah. They didn't, they had too many bonding jumpers, had objectionable current, had electromagnetic interference, uh, the electronics going wacko, and they thought that they, the solution was to have a clean ground instead of a dirty ground. When they, that's when they started adding electronics, okay? Right. And then they had daisy chain the coaxial cable. You know what I'm talking about? Like thin token, wire Ethernet. Token ring. Token ring. And then, of course, right. you have neutral ground bonds connected in multiple places in the building. And then we have this great big mass. And I'm thinking, okay, let's go outside to the building or let's go right. and run a separate ground. Instead of fixing the problem, exactly. they created another problem. But then we learned how to. Right. Now, here's an example of a generator. You wouldn't want to take a generator and ground it to the earth. Right. And then run an equipment grounding conductor. Because at the service, which we're going to talk about, we have to ground the metal parts to the earth. John, are we grounding this part to the earth because we're trying to clear a fault? No. Thank you, sir. <laughs> that was a, that was a I quick no. That was, that was like, <laughs> it's been no the whole time. but it's, it's, Okay, we're not. No, no sir. Okay. But we're grounding that because in the event lightning strikes outside somewhere, it moves magnetic fields, it creates some voltage in the metal parts, it's a high frequency discharge going on the outside of the grounding electric conductor. It just maybe will dissipate, maybe it won't, who knows what it's going to be. The theory is that it might work, maybe, whatever. We're going to do it anyhow. Yes, sir. So back over here, last thing we want to do is do this. Generac used to have a lug on the outside of the generators. Then they moved the lug on the inside, and they told me, well, we have to put that lug there, Mike. It's required. It's required by the UL standard. And then I noticed, okay, well, they don't have it there at all, which means it was never required by the UL standard. So generator manufacturers, Generac in particular, there might be others, specified drive a ground rod connected to this lug. Well, that would be the last thing you'd want to do is make that connection right. because you're damaging your equipment. And now I've done some conversations with them and other people in the industry. We don't see the lug on the outside. We don't see the lug on the inside. And as a matter of fact, the instructions were changed that tell you not to drive a ground rod for that generator. I think the industry is moving and I think we're doing pretty good. But this is the reason why you don't want to have anything connected to two places in the earth. Because if everything is bonded together, above ground, and everything gets bonded together below ground, and you run one wire from the top to the bottom, we're good to go. Good to go. But two wires from the top to the bottom, no bueno, senor. Now, 250.54 says this, and you know, I actually didn't realize it said this until, I'm going to say this year, and I don't know when it came into the code. It's probably been there for longer than I realized. It says the earth cannot serve as an effective ground fault current path, but it doesn't say it this way because of the high contact resistance of the ground rod to the earth. And equipment grounding conductor is required for all circuits. So, Mario, read to me what this says. Okay, so 250.54 auxiliary grounding electrodes. The last sentence. The last sentence. Um, 
<clears throat> but the earth shall not be used as an effective ground fault current path as specified in 250.4A5. Now, let me explain what he said there. He said, but, which means the first part was something. The first part was saying, hey, if you want to, not required, you can have a supplemental electrode, but you don't have to have it connected to other electrodes. It doesn't have to be sized at 25066. It doesn't have to have the 25 ohms, but you can't use that supplementary electrode to serve as an effective ground fault current path. And so that was put in at some cycle that I didn't know when that was. Okay, so reminding us what it is. And here's the picture. Here's an example of using a, uh, a, an auxiliary electrode, not having an equipment grounding conductor or an effective ground fault current path, not clearing the fault. And of course, male dogs have a tendency to die more than the females. But, you know, males are not as smart as women. That's just the way it works. So. <laughs>